I'm just curious, how many people here actively invest in something sometimes? How many people here invest uh, on a pre-seed level sometimes? Oh, good. Only pre-seed. So, um, the, uh, what I, so my approach is a little different. Uh, I, I purposely don't have slides because I, I don't believe that the, uh, the characteristics of what to uh, I invest in you know, uh, my, my first rule is when people pitch me, they can't use a PowerPoint deck or, 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 the, or any kind of, I don't look at slides. It's uh, my, whether I'm in a cafe, or whether I'm in someone's office, it's a, it's a no PowerPoint zone. So you have to throw away the presentation. And if they actually don't have working product, I don't want to see a prototype, I, I don't want to see a mock of anything. Because all they could prove to me is that they outsource to somebody else, maybe an idea. And so what I focus on primarily are the people and the team. Uh, and what I've learned, is uh, really to invest in teams and, and, and to invest in uh, you know, uh, companies with one person who can write code and is visionary and is an amazing executor on business. Uh, that's terrific, but they still need a team. And a team, in my definition, is at least two people. Uh, someone who can, who, and, and I actually like geographically dispersed teams sometimes because it means that work can continue almost 24 by seven or at least you know 17 hours a day versus Ten hours a day. Um, I also work look for people who are driven. You know, when you go to if people go to college or even in high school, you know, you don't learn how to work twenty four by seven or learn to work nine to five. You know, the, the people I never will invest in knowingly are nine to five entrepreneurs. You know, it's one thing to have a day job to support your habit of being a, an entrepreneur and needing to bootstrap and needing to work your ass off. That I totally respect. But for people who show up and leave and go on in their lives and then come back to it. I try to avoid that as much as I can. Because I, I think that you know, when, you, when you want to do a startup, you're living the startup. I mean, you are the startup. I mean, I do believe that. I believe that yeah, the startup is a reflection of, um, of who you are, and who your friends are, and how you are. And you know, uh, I, I, you, my friend Yossi Vardy is quoted saying that revenue is a distraction. I believe that tremendously. I, I believe that. Uh, when you're looking at companies, if they're showing revenue, good afternoon. Uh, if, if a company presents uh, revenue early, that it could be a sign that it's an amazing lifestyle business. Yeah, we, we have examples of this. And, uh, you know, lifestyle businesses are great for the person whose lifestyle it is, but it's really hard to um, have an exit. And uh, I don't know about you guys, if you're investing, but, uh, you know, in the same breath, when I meet somebody, I almost will go to tell me, okay, what's your exit strategy? Which some people find to be really obnoxious. But if you think about it, you know, um, I'm not, we're not investing in real estate. See, if we were building an office building right here, maybe we raise $100 million, maybe, as a general, maybe we have to take a management fee. If we're lucky, we rent it up. And we have cash flow. And if I have 1% of the building as general partner, 99% gets distributed to the investors, this monthly cash flow that happens every month, and this participation. And that as investors, we're getting a cash on cash return, and when and if the office building is sold, we have a, a terminal value, which then gets distributed based on some back end split, and that's understood. But if you're investing in someone's, um, uh, what I call a candy store, that is to say someone who's created this amazing business that's great for cash flow, where as a traditional equity investor, you get nothing, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the ability to get returns from that are far and few between. I mean, yes, if they're doing phenomenally well, they, they can be rolled up into another company, and yes, there's corporate M&A, and yes, there's you know, corporate development, but by and large, um, those things just don't happen in the real world. So I've learned to avoid um, uh, candy stores. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know about your experiences, but I, I, so I, what I, when I look for when I look for people, when I ask for the exit strategy, I want, to under, I want them to understand from the very beginning that there's only one way out, <laughs> and for me anyway, right, well, actually the two ways out, you can go out of business. Um, but if we're gonna have an exit, you know, for me, it means that you, you accomplish something amazing. So the people who I'm gonna be the first investor into, I wanna make sure of because we're at such strong disadvantages for success that they have all the various ingredients needed in order to uh, maybe be successful. And, and success is relative. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very relative term because when I'm doing investing, you know, my typical terms, uh, I look, I, my typical deal flow is a, I invest in uh, 400K pre-money where um, I'll put up between uh, 12, uh, 10 and 
and take an option for within three months to invest another ten to twenty five thousand. And the uh, the terms that I that and basically the uh, uh, the milestones are given to me by the entrepreneur. So it's not like I'm telling somebody you should do this, this, that. They tell me. All I do is hold them accountable. And one of the mistakes most entrepreneurs make is they believe that this option I have is an obligation. They forget the warrant's actually my, my option, not theirs. In some cases, they build their business assuming I'm giving them more money or feel like guilting me into giving them more money. Uh, and, and in the last year and a half, my, my investing's become a little bit more sophisticated because uh, there was a change in the, I, most of my investments these days are in Israel uh, just because that's where I have great deal flow. And uh, due to a change in tax law in Israel, there's now the angel law, which is pretty phenomenal. It basically provides uh, the people who have to pay taxes there, not I, but, but people who have to pay taxes there, an opportunity to, instead of paying money, their tax money to the government, to defer it by investing, by, by investing in a startup. And if the company, if the startup had a failure, well, they pay their taxes. And if the startup has an exit, they get to defer and then pay, you know, they get the, they get the equity appreciation on what they invested, which I think is pretty cool. So uh, there's a fund that co-invests with me. So these days, if I meet a startup with my typical term sheet, if I'm putting up 10, my, my fund will put up 10. Ma basically, it's a matching fund for the first two phases of investing. So if I meet someone who's doing really something terrific, um, they'll get a you know, minimum of typically 20000 up to $100,000 from us based on, based on our terms. And I, I don't know about what levels you look to invest in, but when I'm, when I'm doing early stage stuff, um, that's what I look at. And uh, what I can share with you is over the last, I've done uh, over, about somewhere, somewhere between 25 and 30 deals since July of 2011 in Israel. And of the last 27 deals I've done, 25 is still alive. So it's not so much about pray and spray, although we're always praying for people's success. Uh, you know, in one case, a company failed because after, the, after we invested and they got raised more money, they went through an accelerator and they realized this startup life wasn't for them. <laughs> and uh, there was another situation where I am a complete idiot. Um, 17 years of investing, one of the things which is a never for me is never does my money ever go to pay salaries. It's just, you know, you're gonna, I'm not saying you should starve, but I mean, figure out a way to pay your rent or figure out a way to you know, uh, pay for coffee. But uh, I, I invested in a really, uh, I thought, terrific food network, uh, foodie, uh, foodie uh, startup, uh, really smart guys. And uh, this was August of last year. And I, uh, I, came, I came with my first investment, ready to follow up with the second one. Was I was in Israel, met with them in August. I came back and met with them in December. Uh, I was there in between, but I didn't see them. And I see them in December, all excited, wanting to get an update, because I do look to do that. And they told me that they were, they were out of business. I said, what do you mean? Well, we're bankrupt. I said, what? Well, you see, what they did is, it was three guys. They took my $25,000 investment, they chopped it up three ways, and they took a third, a third, a third each month between September, October, November. And, um, and they were gone. Because uh, they didn't tell me that one of the partners was really burnt out after a year of doing this without it making any money. And I still like the people. I still think they're nice people, but uh, shame on me. But I never did tell them specifically. You can't take the money for salaries. So now I'm very specific about certain things. But, this is, but I did get by 17 years yeah, uh, of, not, of not having to, 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 to feel uh, used. And I, I was really, really upset in the beginning. But I realized they didn't realize they did anything wrong. And, and like they, they were not malicious. They just thought this is what they're supposed to do. Because they didn't go to school to be a startup. There was no just rules of investing. And, it was just a handshake, but one of the things which I've been fortunate about being able to do, so I have a portfolio now that's active. Um, I actually couldn't tell you how many. I, I know that uh, for, 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 for counting, I think I have somewhere between 60 and 80 active investments that go back to 1997. Uh, I, I have been fortunate to invest in companies like uh, Twitter and Foursquare. Those are not Israeli startups. Um, uh, I think my most profitable tweet ever in my life was the day that Fred Wilson announced that uh, he was re that Union Square Ventures was, was uh, uh, well, they, they led the A round for Twitter. So I said, soon, and I was online at that very moment, I saw his tweet, so I sent him a direct message, can I join? And uh, two days later he said I was in. Now understand though that, that my milestones for investing in 2007 was 400k free money for $25,000. So when Fred told me that I was in for fifty thousand dollars for a twenty million pre, I gulped real hard. You know, Twitter was a platform which I was using extensively by then, 
and, and something which was part of my day to day life, but still, I was a bit nervous. And uh, uh, I was, and I, I, I couldn't even diversify the risk. I couldn't find anyone to really even split it with. It just, I took it. And uh, it turned out to be the most profitable tweet I've ever had so far. <laughs> um, because while Twitter was assenting to whatever was 10 billion in valuation, you know, I couldn't believe all this, so I believed in taking some money off the table as things were happening. And for a little while, there was a secondary market for Twitter stock, which doesn't exist right now. But I did liquidate a little bit of my portfolio at a billion valuation, three billion and eight billion. So um, it turns out that $50,000, when it gets multiplied by a really big number, yeah. <laughs> is not a bad thing. <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, I, I would, you know, you, you could argue that, you know, one of the elements of successful investing is uh, serendipity and synchronicity. And, and I look at that synchronicity and serendipity as being a metaphysical attributes that uh, really dictate all my investing. You see, because when I look for startups to invest in, it's not about their business plan because I don't give a shit. It, it's not about the business model because I think that's distracting. It's about the people. Now, it's not that they shouldn't have a business model, but I spent the first part of my career doing projections. I was an, I'm an un, unemployed accountant. I had a company after that called Spreadsheet Solutions, and I spent seven years doing financial forecasting. And besides knowing about certain mistakes I made in spreadsheets, which still haunt me to this very day, I know that the only thing that's ever accurate is hindsight. And whenever I look at a, for, look, whenever I look at a startup, all I ever look at is the expense sheet. Because no one knows their income. Nobody knows how much they're going to make. And anyone who feels scared because they, they, they know that they're going to be so successful, and they don't want to show it because it seems too successful, it's true. It's not believable. So I, if anything, I kind of try to figure out well, how many people do they need? Are they going to have four people or eight people? And you know, without putting themselves, you know, you know it's a bad sign when a startup you invest in on day one, you come back 90 days later and they have early on chairs, these really fancy chairs. What if one of my startups I invested in uh, decides to take my money and um, go to the most expensive rent district in the area. And um, uh, they also lost them. I, this is like five years ago, though. But they, they also burned through my money. They basically bought chairs, for, nice chairs, nice furniture, great office space. And like six months, they were gone. And uh, I kind of like, from, I didn't tell them they can't do that. So that was their idea of living. And uh, it's, it's always a sign. You know, I mean, you typically see it in overfunded startups, not startups that only had $25,000 to start with. Um, and I, if I did show videotape, if I, if I, uh, when, I when I do my startups um, meetings, uh, I typically will pick a day or two, and my meetings typically take place over coffee or a cappuccino or in Hebrew tafuf, which is a little bit different. And uh, I will do up to 16 meetings a day. So my days get a little blurry, but I'll start off with breakfast, do back-to-back -back meetings, take an hour off for lunch, and then go right to dinner time, have dinner, and, um, and then basically sometimes after dinner. And I'm being... Party. Oh, party comes later, right? I, but I, I try to avoid pitches and party on the same day because it gets too blurry. Um, and I don't really remember. Like, I remember the deals that are being pitched to me at that very moment. But if I run into a person three days later, I don't always remember them because the intensity is of that moment. And, and I'm focused, and I'm listening, and I'm there. It's not like I'm bullshit. I, I am there. But I, I, because I see so many people, it gets just blurry in terms of just everything that I'm hearing. But invariably, I'm always seeing trends. The reason why, during a trip, I like to see 30 to 40 startups or 10 to 20 startups is I'm always looking for trends. I'm trying to figure out what's hot right now. I could tell you, two years ago, I met like seven startups in the same week that all wanted to be in the new Foursquare. You know, people were getting into to hyper-local geo of this, or people getting into dating or this. And there was lots of trend, micro-trends I looked at. Um, and I should also mention that my biases are toward investing in things that I think I know something about. You know, I, I have um, made mistakes investing in things that I liked but knew nothing about. Uh, and as a hobbyist, I've done really poorly as an investor. Uh, you know, when I invest, so I don't do anything other than app services, internet app services. That's my sweet spot. Um, I, I, and I, you know, I will do, I, I have a secret passion for music. So I have surprisingly about five or six music companies in my portfolio. Um, I really don't do e-commerce, but I have three e-commerce startups in the portfolio, and I have uh, some apps. I have some. Fa I, I do. I have a few women-led startups. Uh, I have um, a bunch of video stuff. Uh, I call it stuff because the technical behind it is I don't know what it is, but it, it's all fun. But it, and other, but the other criteria. So one thing is um, I meet with these people over coffee, and um, 
and they, it's so, too many people don't realize that I don't just want to see PowerPoints. When I tell them to close their laptop, you know, it's almost a test to see basically, you know, how, what's their reaction. Most of the people who react positively, we go into the next phase. There are some times where I just kill the me meeting right then. I should also tell you that if your term sheet's well known, the most crazy stuff will happen to you sometimes. I've had the, 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 the experience where I felt it was a game show called um, uh, Spend Jeff Pulver's Money. But some people heard that I will invest up to $50,000. And on two occasions that I remember, people brought me three spreadsheets showing me how they're going to spend my money if I invest. Mm -hmm. I kid you not. And it was hilarious. It, wasn't, it was nothing necessarily related to their startup, but more like how they're going to spend the money I give them. And it was very presumptuous, but very fun. And, uh, and if I did run a camera over the cups of coffee I, 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 I've shared with people, I've seen some of the most hysterical startups ever. I, I, there's, and, and, I, and I do, uh, do not disrespect this one woman who saw me on my last trip. Now, I have a, fa I have a background. Uh, my, my family, one, one generation, was in the garment industry. And uh, I've done conferences in fashion. And I've actually made a fun, bunch of, uh, some of my relatives were buyers for Bloomingdale's, Macy's, uh, in the shoes and other stuff. And I have uh, some, some knowledge that I don't always admit to about you know, certain parts of fashion and fashion marketing and stuff. Anyway, I meet a woman who was a Facebook friend of mine. And a lot of these p uh, pitches come to me either through friends of friends or through Facebook. And she wants to meet me. And uh, I said, OK. And she came, with me with, came to me with a seasoned CTO that was 30 years in the industry and a kid out of Shimon Italian, which is like the, uh, I don't know, the secret intelligence force of the army. And I'm trying to figure out what does this young kid, old kid, and her have in common. It turned out nothing. Um, her idea was uh, her pain point, and I, I don't know about you, but uh, I don't know if you've discussed pain points in presentations, but I, I am not, um, I'm not a really big fan of startups that dress pain. I like pleasure. Uh, I like to focus on, on good stuff. Uh, whenever I'm pitching someone one of my startups, uh, you know, what's the pain point? It's like, maybe you like what we're doing. Why does it have to solve pain? So anyway, this one woman wanted to, and I, and I, and I want to be cognizant of the women here, so I, mean, I don't mean any disrespectful at all, but uh, this woman told, walked into this meeting, and she was wearing, I, I think, uh, like a, like almost like one foot high heels, like 11, like she was a tall woman, and she wore like 11 inch heels, it was something ridiculously tall. And she said, you know, what bothers me, my pain point, and why I'm doing, I want to do a startup to solve this problem. I said, what problem are you talking about? Well, she, she, said, she said to me, did you see my shoes? I said, yeah. Well, what I want to do is I want, to, I, want to, I want you to invest in a startup that will give me hydraulic heels. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt like I was in the fifth grade science project. And, and she took out these plans for, for shoes with a hydraulic pump. And she basically brought, she was going to use Bluetooth to connect to this pump. So when she connects to, with a Bluetooth, the, the, the heels go up and they go down. And she wanted to then sell this to manufacturers in shoe business. So I, I asked her a simple question. Uh, do you have any retail experience in the shoe business? No. Does anyone on your team, have they, have they been shoe buyers? Do you know anything about shoe manufacturing? Have they done anything? No. So I asked her, so tell me your team. So um, one was a friend of theirs, 30 years CTO. She felt she needed someone smart. And this kid, she figured she could do the programming. I said, oh. And I was laughing really, really hard. Uh, but I didn't say anything. And of course, I go, and Israel is like kind of a small country. I go the next night to a party, and she's there. And I felt so like uncomfortable because she was still my Facebook friend. And, and I, I, I thought this like a stupid, but I, this is what happens, right? So I don't know about you, like, so I, but I did tell her. I said, you know, if you would have brought with me a credible team, someone that actually understood shoe manufacturing, shoe design, someone could actually show me how this hydraulic could be put into the shoe manufacturing process in such a way that it could actually not, it would actually find the right fabric. It wouldn't just be destroyed every time it's deployed. Sounded kind of cool. Um, I mean, I've, I, I've invested in this. I knew, you know Bar Raffaelli? So I invested in Under Me. I figured if Bar can't sell underwear, who can? <laughs> Bless you. I mean, it's, it's, she, she's an Israeli fashion model, I figured. I, but it's, she's worldwide fashion but she's, but, but those are, you know, so those are not typical, but like, um, but the shoe stuff happens. And it's like, how do you deal with this? But for me, it was about team. So, so at the end of the day, for me, it's, 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 I, I believe in these metaphysical stuff because it's not measurable by paper. It's not measurable by performance. Uh, a lot of time when I invest in startups, you know, I am giving the person the first chance to have a startup. Like if you run, a, I run conferences. 
And about 10% of the people who speak at my conferences, they're first time speakers. They may suck. But I believe that everyone should have a chance to speak their mind and be on stage and be heard. Because you never know how amazing someone could be if you give them a chance to be heard. And it's the same thing with startups. I mean, just because someone didn't do a startup before, had no history whatsoever in an industry, doesn't mean they can't be amazing. You know, if I had time, I would explain to you how I am actually the real Forrest Gump. You know, my, my life has been a series of coincidences which I cannot explain that how it happens, but a magical things just do happen occasionally, which I can't rely on, but I can't ignore. And I believe that if I have this happening around me, that it's quite possible for other people to happen to them. Well, and this is why I believe the next person you meet could change your life. Or, and why at the corollary of it, you could change someone else's life by talking to them, by saying something right now that two years from now they're going to remember and ah, they'll do it. And that, you know, the, 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 there are two causes for death in startups, I find, depending upon the stage of the startup. The later stage startups is entrepreneurial denial. Right, that's when someone does a round. Typically, and this is the trouble with uh, first-time entrepreneurs doing a friends and family round. If they price their round too high, and they do a venture round, and it ratchets it down, too often I've seen people say no to VCs, or no because it's because it because it hurt their ego. And too often those companies went out of business, and had nothing to do at all about the team or about the ideas. It's the all ego. And so that's something which I get blindsided by sometimes, because uh, entrepreneurial denial is um, something which is just really, really um, uh, hard, to, hard to see and really hard to, to, and it's an ego trip, you know, and, and it's something which I can't really manage myself, I have to accept, you know, it's just, but it, it is a leading cause, cause of death in startups. Um, and the other part is really, uh, and, I, and this is also why I think team matters more than just person, is vision. You see, I've had startups try their asses off and failed, but they, um, but they tried their best. I've run into lots of other people that saw a brick wall five miles away, but they didn't pivot, or they didn't, they didn't uh, accelerate strong enough to crash the wall, or, or find a way to redirect around the wall, they went into the wall. And that's like unexcusable in my case. I think it's just, uh, it's just if you see a wall, deal with it. <laughs> you know, don't, don't use that as your, explain, as your reason why you failed. I mean, I, I don't accept that. I, I mean, I accept it happens. But when, you, when you're looking at, you know, the startups, it's, it, there's, your know, team to me matters. And so what I do sometimes is I engage in social activities with companies I want to invest in. This is not going to be seen in any manual or any book, but I will go out to dinner with people or I might go drinking with these people. I want to see how they act in public when there's no cameras and uh, uh, no walls. And I want to see how people are in terms of, uh, now I'm not judging them, I want to see if I can get drunk and have fun with them. Or I want to just, just, just enjoy life with them. I'm not trying to, I'm not saying, oh my God, what they do. I just want to make sure I can have fun, because if, if they fail, at least I want to know why I gave money to some good people who will do good things. And that's the other thing also about startups. I, I really believe that most of the time when a company I invested in failed, they, didn't, they failed at this. But they're going to be awesome at some point. And that I believe that whether or not they're successful with me, they're, um, they will be successful. And that's really the, 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 the unspoken point is when to give up. I mean, the, the hardest part about investing in somebody, and in, fa in, fa in fact, investing in yourself, is not never to give up. Because if you believe in something, and this is really, again, I don't have time to, ex to really go into depth on this, but I, I think that the power of believing in something transcends almost everything. And when you believe in something and you can see a light and feel an energy that gives you the strength to get through a day, that you're unstoppable. The moment you start stop to see the light, when you start having self-doubt, when you don't have strength, you know, you may let go. And too often people were so close to making it, but they just gave up. And that's something that people learn. You know, and you know, maybe if you had a bad idea, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't believe in bad ideas either, by the way, I should mention that, that for me, once I get over the hump that I like the person or I like the team, I'm in. Uh, in real life, and uh, you could look at your own life about this, but uh, in almost every case of things that you have in your day-to-day -day life right now, is someone else's good mistake. Except for deep, deep research into medical research, everything that you take for granted is someone that, most people didn't go out to discover one thing, they were trying to do something else, and they made this happen. It, it, it's those, the serendipity and joy of good mistakes powers the world. And the chance of, you, of someone discovering something else by trying to do one other thing is magic. 
And so I, I believe that that's one of the byproducts of investing in somebody, is giving them the chance to discover something else. And so while people are pushing real hard, um, you know, having a belief system and understanding the possibility of doing something, that's the hardest part. I, uh, for those of you outside the States, you may not be familiar with it, but one of the companies which I'm attributed to starting, I started really accidentally, but it became the first successful uh, broadband voice, voice broadband company in America, a company called Vonage. And uh, when we started Vonage, actually Vonage was a restart of another company I did, but when Vonage was becoming Vonage, uh, one of the things we tried to do was to hire the best um, engineers possible because what we were trying to do at the time in a world where broadband wasn't working so well to deliver high quality voice over broadband. Um, the trouble was, the uh, reality of the market was that it was really challenging technically to do this right. So we thought we'd hire the best engineers who had 30 years experience in telecom to make it happen. Invariably, as different people came in for the interview, you know what they said? Can't do it. I've, we've, we've tried before and it didn't work. We can't do it. Guess what? We didn't hire those people. You know who we ended up hiring? The ones that said yes. Actually, not the ones that said yes. We hired a bunch of college students <laughs> who didn't know they couldn't do it. <laughs> and in a very short time, they did it. It required a totally fresh rethink. And that's something about entrepreneurship, which we were teaching by doing, is give, don't, tell no, don't tell people the word no. Because I find that if someone thinks they can't do something, they have an out. If, thing, if people don't believe that there's, they can't do it, magic happens. And it happens all the time. So it's, it's that belief system. And as an entrepreneur, as an investor, you want to believe every company you're investing in is going to be successful. Now, mathematically, that may not be happening, but when you're investing on that very day, you want to see stuff. And you see magic. You, you can see it in the eyes of the people. It's much like someone who's on a talent show. You, know, you, you, you could feel... You know who the stars are, they have stage presence. There's something about them that stands out, that attracts you to them, which is why you want to be part of their future. And, you know, and to, be, to do early stage investing is really uh, um, an honor in terms of uh, the chance to connect, the chance to engage, the chance to connect, and to touch people's lives. Now, one of the things which uh, Jacob and I have been doing for the past year, uh, Jacob's over here from the blue shirt, um, we, I have a portfolio, uh, an active portfolio in Tel Aviv of about 80 co-founders, and I've created a, 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 a secret, well, it's really a hidden group, on, it's not a secret, but it's, it's a hidden group only for my co-founders on Facebook, and, I, and they're from di different stages of life in terms of their company. Uh, some failed, actually, but they're all there, and they're there to connect with each other all the time. So if you're looking for a talented UI UX person, you're looking for a good CTO, you're looking for a salesperson, they try to source stuff, or someone's going for funding, occasionally there's some knowledge shared, and once a quarter, when possible, we bring people together and do off-sites. Where all we're trying to do is to facilitate the, the interconnecting of people to people. And it's amazing, because relationships happen through that, and it's really good. Uh, uh, we, and, and occasionally we're able to help introduce stuff. I've been fortunate to have a pretty strong social network, and. Um, some of the startups I've invested in have reached, have reached out and raised more money. Um, some are, uh, again, I'm not from denial. You know, it's like, I want to invest $50,000 in a startup. The most frustrating thing is when I only can invest 25. Because they didn't want to break equity. You see, so I had, I had a founding team, six people. They have their slices of equity. And I'm only taking 5%, I'm only taking 5% right? It's too much. They don't want to give it up. <laughs> yeah, I like what they're doing so much. I deal with that crap. But it's, 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 it's like such a frustrating experience because you want to be there for them. So like one of my startups, finally, a year later, they ran the, the, the $25,000, you know, the $12,000 I put in, my partner put in, they finally ran out. But it took them a year to blow through $25,000. That's the other thing, by the way. Pretty amazing the way you're able, people, some people are actually able to manage that cash and to go so far. And if you actually have a founding team that's great developers, you're not outsourcing too much. It's just the cost for the other stuff. And, um, but they're actually going to do okay despite the fact that they didn't want to give up much equity. And it wasn't about the equity for me, it's just that their mindset is that they, they want to hold on to everything. Yeah. Um, and now, as far as secrets go, I will share with you a few secrets which uh, have worked for me, and in some cases, these took my, me and my entire life to learn. But um, the big thing for me is, is keeping it fun. It's the F, the U, the N. Uh, that doesn't stand for anything else other than fun, or in Hebrew, kef. Uh, I don't know how to say fun in other languages, but it's about fun. Uh, one thing I discovered through absolute sheer um, luckiness, was that if you throw a party for a thousand strangers, deal flow happens. 
and, uh, and it just does. I mean, it's, it's the craziest thing, but in, in 2005, I ran a, uh, 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 an event to Israel to honor the voice over IP industry, to honor 23 people who pioneered voice over IP, uh, and, and people from the early 90s through, that, through 2005 who were responsible for making stuff happen. And um, I had a, Jacob help me arrange this event at the mayor's office in Jerusalem. It was a really nice event, right? It was, it was really nice. And, um, and that was a nice part. The next day, I held a symposium in Ramat Aviv uh, about the future of voice over IP. There was a morning session and an afternoon session. And a crazy thing happened to me in between. I held my first press conference ever in Israel. And uh, the media, I had media from all different, uh, from print, from, from TV, from whatever. And someone asked me, a reporter asked me, why am I here? Now, what you don't know about me is that I've been very fortunate that without making any inventions in voice over IP, I made a lot of money in the, in the space, relatively speaking, in my world. So I came back there to say thank you. So I actually told the reporter, I'm here to say thank you. Another reporter jumps in and says, don't lie to us, tell us why you're really here, what's your motivation? <laughs> this got into a 10 minute shouting match. At the end of the 10 minutes, I was hoarse in my voice, I more or less said, fuck you, and I left. And I had a hard time doing the second, the, I was so angry, I had a friend of mine kick, uh, spend the first half of the second day moderating because I just could not get over the fact that no one believed me that I was coming to Israel to say thank you to the people who helped make this industry happen because because of this industry my life was saved because I got fired from my day job um, and I created a company and I, I had a really nice exit and did all this other stuff and, uh, and did all these other startups but I just, said, I just said I came to say thank you and no one believed me so what did I do? The next year I came back to get even with the press in June of 2006, in the Port of Tel Aviv, I held my first event for 1,000 people, my salute uh, to the Israeli high-tech industry. And I found that if you provide uh, open bar for seven hours to a bunch of people, um, interesting things happen. Amongst which, uh, within a year or two, I, uh, more interesting things happened. So I did, I did a, an annual party. Uh, I didn't do it for two years, but I did, a annual, I did a party in the summer, the winter, Jacob and I were crazy enough the next year to bring the Black Eyed Peas, the rest of development, the commitments to Israel. We produced uh, Jerusalem Rocks, right? And it was a day night concert, and, and that was fun. That was part of the fun. Not for the old that was just for fun. But we're doing fun stuff, right? And then, I, then every time I go to Israel, I try to host a breakfast or try to help people with networking. And um, the end result of all this, by keeping it fun, amazing deal flow. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me um, through these parties, through someone's cousin, someone's brother, someone's sister, someone's father, someone's mom, through this. Also, through the end of 2010, we helped create 11 marriages. This part was a, I, this much I was keeping track of, I lost track after that. And it was a very social, fun, fun thing. So by keeping it fun, you know, it allows, and okay, we'll be, I'll be done. Um, it, it allows you um, a chance to do it. So for me, it's, the, the investing part is a byproduct of a lifestyle that's driven by helping to make the world a better place, by finding people to believe in, and taking a chance. And, and not every team's gonna be perfect. And sometimes you invest in teams and they break up, just like you know, bands. You know, in fact, I look at every, every, invest, every investment I make, I, I actually treat it as a rock band. I try to figure out who's the lead singer, who's the drummer, who's the guitarist. <laughs> and occasionally, what well, the crazy thing was, of the 27 startups I did uh, the last year and a half, seven of them were bands. Failed musicians doing startups, oh, wow. which is kind of crazy. Uh, and uh, I do wish I could sing, um, but I do karaoke. Uh, I, I, I love doing karaoke parties. So I found that if I actually bring my startups who are bands together, with, and I'm friendly with a bunch of Israeli uh, artists now, so I have uh, <coughs> doing karaoke with real singers is not embarrassing. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> And as long as I just mouth the words but don't sing anything, it's really good. <laughs> and it's just a really fun thing. So I believe the secret to success in investing in pre-seed startups is fun. And you can have all the business models you want. You can have all the criteria you want. You can try to figure out, gee, if I invest in this and this. And by the way, I don't double down. I learned not to. I, I have this other life lesson that since 1997, if I've invested in th close to 300 startups, I have found that whenever I invested more than $150,000 in anything other than my own companies, and even my own companies for the most part, I lost everything. The times where I've invested between $25,000 to $50,000, I thank God, I've had phenomenal success. I cannot explain why or how, but it's been, mathematics don't explain it, so it's metaphysical. It's, there's something about feeling, it just, but it works out really, really well. So, uh, and it has to, it's only, and it's 100% risk to at-risk capital. 
But for me, I could not think of a better place to spend my time or spend my money in terms of trying to power the dreams of other people. But I think that's where, the, that's where the future lies, is trying to help other people do something. And again, you never know how your impact is going to be. What I try to avoid, although it doesn't have, although I, sometimes I get persuaded into it, I don't like just being money. You know, you might tell me about an amazing startup that's doing $3 million, come on, come on for $25,000 for the A round. Most of the time I'll pass. I will not do it. Because if I have a chance to invest $25,000 in that company that's already on a roll of getting funded, or giving someone their first $25,000 so they can have a company, I, give, I go for life. I go for giving that somebody the chance to find who, that, who they are and to discover their inner magic. So that, that's what I've discovered. Now, I didn't have any of these goals or objectives when I started out. I was just looking for fun. And it's turned out to be uh, something which I have no regrets about, and I would do all over again. And, and with me, as I have exits, I refinance, and I, I mean, it just turned out for me, I had a really good year a couple years ago, and I more or less took the proceeds of my investments from then, and I redistributed it to, you know, what would be 40 startups. And, uh, but I don't, I don't look to go to get greedy, because whenever I've gotten greedy, I've always gotten burned. And that was the first sign. I mean, I, I remember so often I tried to go big, and I lose. <laughs> keep it small, keep it tight, and it works. But that's for me. But for your own investments, the thing is, if you have too much money to invest, you know, find something else to do with that money. Um, but if you want to do micro-investing, you know, the world's in your favor right now. But just do it smartly, and do it, and find people who will appreciate you for believing in them. Because these are people who will never forget you for the rest of their lives. Because to be that person that gave them chance. That's just a gift which you know, we'll always give at some level. Anyway, thank you for listening. If you have time for q and I'm happy to do it here. But thank you, guys. We do have time for questions. Does anyone want to ask Jeff? What's your You know, that's like, uh, well, first of all, it's a good thing you asked me to name all my startups because I, uh, I can't remember that. The most fun, um, well, I think the most, one of the most fun startups I ever did, um, I had some I did myself too. Uh, the, the, one of the, in, in America, in the 1970s and 1980s, there were a lot of rock and roll musicians who lost their bands who had lead singers. And uh, for a year and a half, I was an investor in the, what was called, the, it was a startup called The Voices of Classic Rock. And these were like, it was the voice of Toto. It was, like, it was like all these bands from the 70s and 80s that got together. They had one common back, and they had all these singers. And I invested in them, thinking that they would make a lot of money being uh, vintage artists selling. And they um, didn't make any money. But I went to all these parties. <laughs> and, uh, I heard some good music. And, and I heard, it helped make some great music. And it was, a, it was pure fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to explain why you do things in the moment. And I guess maybe that's the other thing is have no regrets. It's, it's like too often people do things and have regrets about them, whether it's photographs, whether it's things they said. If you live in the moment and you own that moment, you can never have regrets, right? If you live in the now. It, it's just that when you try to take it back, then you get in trouble. But if, you, if you're fully aware of what you're doing when you're doing it and you take ownership of it, it's there. So I have no regrets for investing in that band and believing because it was fun. And um, so that was pure fun. In terms of startups, I, I think that the funniest startup, it's not so funny, but uh, in Israel there's a group, if you ever do want to get involved in high tech in, in, in Israel, I believe you should visit the Garage, garage Geeks in Cologne. Um, and two of my friends, uh, I, in 2007, I used to do my breakfast, uh, oh, I actually have two things to quickly tell you. One was, uh, in 2007, I used to spend all my time when I went to Israel to the, in the Hilton, uh, uh, in Tel Aviv, the Tel Aviv Hilton. It was like my plate, my go-to place. It was like the hotel I just went to by default. And that summer, it was a really crazy thing. Um, it's in the newspaper, you can actually read the story. It was a very hot summer in Israel that year. And uh, one of the papers sent two undercover reporters to the various hotels to check out um, how difficult it was to sneak into the pool. Mm. And uh, when they got to the Hilton, this, uh, th these two reporters pretended to be, um, go to the, they go to the security guard, and they say, um, who are you? And the person said, he's Jeff Pulver. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the security guard said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. And he had, and, and, and so he, but he didn't get into the pool. But when I read about this in the newspaper, I knew I could no longer stay at that, stay there, stay at that um, hotel ever again, because I felt a little bit uncomfortable. 
But that same summer, two friends of mine who were two of the co-founders of, of, of Garage Geeks uh, were meeting with me in the Hilton. I used to meet in the Hilton lobby. And I find hotel lobbies to be very nice. And uh, I thought I was meeting with them to talk about the international expansion of, their, of, of Garage Geeks to America. And I was going to give them $25,000 to do that. And lo and behold, these two guys, uh, Svikanetta and uh, Tal Kolozin, tell me, no, 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 they, they want to do in-video uh, in advertising. What? And I said, yeah, yeah. And I didn't, I didn't even listen to what they said. I said, how much do you need? Oh, well, I understand you invest $25,000. I said, yes, here it is. So it turned out that this company, I, I have two friends of mine, they did a bait and switch on me. But that company, his name is Innovid. And uh, I gave them $25,000, and like before I had a chance to give them more money, I actually gave them 50 more. They raised another 50, and then they raised $3 million, $3 million uh, like six months later, nine months later. Then Sequoia got involved last year, I put $9 million in. That turned out to be a really successful company. Um, I, it, was a, it was a fun switch, and it was a positive fun switch and bait on me. But in a bit, they're good guys, and they're now in New York City, and uh, they're actually doing really, really well. And, uh, uh, I don't really do too much. I, I just meet with them. I don't listen. They, they do their own thing and they figure this stuff out. And, and, but it's magic, right? What they showed me was a prototype and I realized they were just, I knew they were brilliant. They were friends of mine. And the, the thing is also about investing in friends, and this is I caution you, that sometimes friends will disappoint you for reasons which life happens. And if you, will, if you make an investment in a friend, you have to be willing to walk away and not let that money get in the way of your relationship. Or don't, or I've lost, you know, because it, it gets too hard otherwise. Um, and, and people will make the best excuses for why things don't work out. Just, you know, if they can just stop, make, stop lying and speak the truth. Because sometimes that's the other hard part, is, is people being brutally honest with themselves. Like why, because like, some people just feel guilty about stuff. And it's like, if you tell them not to waste your money, but it's okay if they make mistakes, because we learn from mistakes. In fact, I think making good, good mistakes makes good life. Um, good things can happen. So yeah, so for me it was uh, Innovid, in a bit as far as a startup that happened by mistake, I mean, I got involved for really no reason, but it was really fun. And, but Voice of Classic Rock, I definitely had a, a good time with those guys. Uh, anything else? Yes? Um, how did you make your very first one? Uh, like when I was like uh, 12 years old? Or? <laughs> no, that made you into an angel investor. I, I probably when I was uh, 12 years old, um, but I, I don't have time to explain that. I uh, I uh, made a, well. See when I when I was growing up, I, I was one of the kids that had no friends. I was really lonely by myself, and my entire lifeline became my ham. I became a ham radio operator. I actually, the time I, I discovered that my uncle had a hobby, and when, it took me from the time I was nine to 12 and a half to to study to learn college physics and Morse code and the rules and regulations to be a ham operator. But by the time I was 12 and a half and I had my license from the government to communicate, I never shut up. And, uh, and it was that ability to reach out to talk to other people that influenced everything I've done it, and, and influenced my involvement directly in voice over IP uh, and me being able to see things just in, from a very different perspective. When I was a teenager, I had, when I was 16, I discovered that if, you don't have to be popular to go to parties if the girls pay you money to be a DJ. So I, 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 didn't, I wasn't invited to go to parties, but I was paid to go to a lot of parties because I love music, so I, DJed, I was a DJ, and I had a software publishing company when I was 16. So I made real money back then. Anyway, um, but once I discovered Voice Over IP, uh, I need about three minutes for this. I'm doing this really fast. Um, in, uh, Jacob actually, what's really funny is in, in, um, I had a day job on Wall Street which was a great learning experience for office politics that lasted from, that, from 93 to 96. But in February of 95, I downloaded some software from Israel, for the first iPhone was actually from Israel, called Vocal, from a company called Vocaltech. And what was crazy for me is that very first day, about 20% of the people online were using their ham radio call signs as their social ID. So, and you had these ham operators pretending to be on the radio talking over a computer. And I'm, something rang in my head like, this is crazy. So I immediately created a mailing list and created a community and for a year or so did all these things to help bring these people together. I had a day job though. I, worked, I was in IT on Wall Street, but this is my hobby. And uh, along the way, Jacob tried to uh, recruit me because he was doing Delta III at the time and he was like really interested in all this. So I know him since 95. Anyway, um, in, uh, in the fall of 95, 
Uh, somebody asked on a mailing list, is it possible to interconnect a telephone and a computer? And as a ham radio operator, I don't know if you ever saw reruns of MASH, but as a kid I was like Radar O'Reilly. I was the one connecting the telephones with the radio, trying to let people make connections overseas. That was me. So I knew it was possible, so I said sure. And in, in November 95, I accidentally created the world's first internet telephony network because I cross-connected the computer with the telephones and people could speak for free. It was really cool. Uh, not scalable, no quality service, but it was kind of cool. And then in March of 96, uh, 300 phone companies in America went to the government and, and filed a petition asking for the sale and use of internet telephony software to be banned in America and the, so and the companies to be regulated as phone companies. And I somehow created a coalition called the Voice on Net Coalition that still exists today, which uh, banned all that, uh, which actually for nine years stopped it from happening. And uh, anyway, I, got, I ended up getting fired from my day job because uh, the, 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 the Canada Fitzgerald Securities, which, which is the World Trade Center, uh, felt that I was too distracted with my hobbies and not focusing on the job, which was all office politics. P.S. I end up starting a conference in New York City uh, in the fall of 96. And uh, the thing was, when I got fired, I had a, a young family with a burn rate, and uh, my parents would not support me at all. I was cut off. And that was like the best thing that ever happened to me. Luckily, though, when I was still employed, American Express was stupid enough to give me an Optima card. And I, I had to go to JFK Airport. I took down $15,000 in traveler's checks. And I went to a venue in New York City, and I put down a deposit for the conference, my first conference. And uh, it was for the catering and stuff. P.S., I, did, I ended up doing this conference uh, with no da database, no marketing, just my mailing list. And 224 people showed up from around the world that, from that day forward, actually influenced the future of voice and telecoms. And I knew nothing about this industry at all to start. This, this mushroomed in that this 224 people conference grew, and I knew nothing about running conferences. In its, within three years, I went from 224 people to about seven to 8,000 people coming to my conferences. And uh, in, in December of 2000, along the way, I started Vonage and a few other startups. And um, in December 2000, a competitor calls me up and asks me, what's my exit strategy? I, I swear to you, I said, what is an exit strategy? I didn't know. They said, you know, like, when are you going to sell your company? I said, why should I sell my company? For the first time in my life, I'm doing something, I'm being paid for it. Because in about a year and a half's time, my revenue went from zero to $15 million. And it was growing, and it was doing really well. But I had it in the back of my head, I had to sell. Now, I didn't, did I mention to you my first conference was on September 10th and 11th, 1996? So I had this, like, premonition, I had to sell. So the, in the summer, of, that summer of 2000, it was our best year ever. This is post about dot com crash post, um, uh, post uh, uh, doc, uh, telecom crisis, this is actually summer 2001. I negotiated a deal in July of 2001. No one had closed? It closed on September 10th, 2001. Mm -hmm. And then 9-11 happened, and my birthday is September 12th, and the company that I worked for lost 700 people. I used to work in the World Trade Center. So you see, it turns out for me, getting fired saved my life. And that deal was, prior, the company that I started for $15,000, I sold for $57 million. Of course, the next day got repriced to 40 million, but it was really impressive to say 40, 57 million. Um, and then, of course, if you ever want to learn about how to piss away 40 million dollars, I can talk about that <laughs> all you want. But um, anyway, so that's how I made my first bit of money, and uh, that did provide a seed, though, for me to be crazy and fun. And uh, but I was always having fun. I when I did these conferences, I used to hire bands like you'd hear on the radio, and I can't sing for my life, but I, and I put in the writer that Jeff will sing Mustang Sally on stage with every band. And sure enough, we did. And it was pure fun. And I, I learned how to take having fun seriously and make it into a business. Anyway, thank you guys. Fabulous. Thank you.